Well, good morning, Rainier View. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff. Uh, I typically am out at our Graham campus where I lead out there, but I am excited to be here with you all this morning and continue our series on breaking the cycle of shame. Uh, and it may seem odd at first, like starting out in January and we're focusing on shame. Like what in the world, right? No, I'm still excited about my goals that I set in a new year, right? We're going to lose that weight. We're going to pay off that bill. We're going to get organized. We're going to eat healthy. Um, we're going to be nicer to people, and right about now, right, is the time where those things start to get shaky uh, and just, you know, get to mid-February, and it's like, what New Year's resolutions, right? Uh, and so it's so easy to, uh, again, not realize the transformation that we want to see happen in our lives. And so the, the reason we're in the series is because we often don't realize the role that shame plays in our lives. Uh, we, don't, we don't recognize that we have this, this voice within us that continues to repeat these scripts of shame that might, we might listen to over and over again, and, and often we're not aware of those. Um, and so if we just try and like block it out, like I'm not going to listen, I'm not going to listen, I'm not going to listen, what tends to happen is what? <laughs> We listen to those voices all the more. They get louder and louder and louder in our lives. And so um, what do we mean by kind of breaking the cycle of shame and, and, and some of those scripts that we listen to, right? Those kind of be something like that, that little voice that tells you, if they only knew, right? And those things that we hold within us and we don't want other people to know. Or that, that little voice that says, you're just not good enough. You're never going to measure up. Or well, for you, it's too late. It's too late for that relationship, that experience, that opportunity. And so these are kind of some of the, the shame scripts that we listen to in our inner lives and that we're in this series because we want to learn how to break free from those. We want to learn how we can, we can stop listening to those and replace those with some new scripts and some different scripts from God's Word and see what the Bible has to say about that. We gather, we gather to proclaim and celebrate the gospel, that it is good news that Jesus came to free us from the power of sin, to free us from the power of shame, but far too often we are trapped by our shame and we don't know what to do about it. Um, and so here's the thing, freedom is, is granted fully and completely. Jesus died to free us from that shame, but we don't automatically experience that. Um, one of my favorite bands uh, is U2, and about 35 years ago, they released the Joshua Tree album, uh, and so there is a song on there, still haven't found what I'm looking for, where a young Bono sings this line. He says, you broke the bonds, you loosed the chains, you carried the cross of my shame, of my shame. You know I believe it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I think that, that that song resonates with our common experience as people because we all experience the gap between what we believe and what we experience. And there's this gap here, and the problem with that gap is that's where shame loves to live. That's where shame thrives, and it grows. And as it grows, it drives a wedge farther and farther and farther between what we believe and what we experience. And again, oftentimes we can be even unaware of it. Sometimes we are. Uh, and so what do we do about that? What do we do about this, this shame that loves to thrive in that gap? And so this morning, I want to give us just three simple steps that we can begin with, no matter where we're at in our faith journey, no matter what struggles we might come in, into the room with today, um, that we can, we can really kind of experience greater freedom from shame. And so this, the first step is simply this, that you need to choose to believe that the God of the universe wants you to live free from shame. The creator of the universe wants you to be free of those feelings of shame. Um, we're going to look at Romans 8 in a moment, and I encourage you to open up your Bibles to Romans 8. Uh, physical, digital, doesn't matter. If you need a Bible, there should be one in the back for you there. Uh, but go ahead and open up to Romans chapter 8, 
And we're going to talk in a moment about the fact that sin can create this stronghold of sin and shame in our lives. That when we use the word stronghold, it just means that uh, that an area of shame can build up in our lives to the point where it gains more and more control. And once, once something becomes a stronghold, it just means it's like the controlling thing in our lives, or it has this predominant influence over what, the way we think and the way we act and the way we interact with other people. Um, and so it's important for us to note that both our own choices around sin uh, can build a stronghold. When we choose to live in a way that we weren't designed to, opposite of the way the creator of the universe designs us to, that can lead to shame building up and a stronghold. But also in our lives, sometimes people do things uh, to hurt us. Maybe we've been part of a difficult season of somebody else's pain and sin, and that brings shame into our own lives, okay? And so whether it's our own choices or whether it's the pain and hurt that's been inflicted upon us by somebody else, both of those can lead to intense feelings of shame in our life. And, and when it has control over us, that's just what we mean by a stronghold. And so we talk about this as one of our rooted rhythms that just something that we need to practice regularly and intentionally in our lives, that we need to pause, we need to consider what's going on in my inner life meaning my heart and my mind, what, what's going on for me in taking stock and pausing. Because some, as I'm talking right now, some of us, we probably know exactly where our shame lives. Like it's front and center and it's a battle and it's a struggle and we're struggling with it right now. Other times when we, when we kind of pause and we reflect that maybe, maybe it's like, okay, um, I've got some areas I need to pay attention to, that this is, is not a controlling, a predominant force in my life, uh, but that if I'm not careful, I can easily end up in a place where this becomes something that is controlling my heart and my mind. Sometimes we're going along great, everything is fine, we're, we're in a great season, and then all of a sudden we realize that there's a pocket of shame in our lives that like, we weren't even aware of, we weren't even thinking about, and then there's new territory that we need to take back uh, that, that built in a just a pocket of shame in our lives uh, that, that we just even weren't aware of. And so where do we begin? How do we get started understanding where to begin with our struggle around the shame that, that we just don't want to open up to anybody else with or we don't know what to do with? And so, again, we're going to begin in Romans 8, beginning in uh, just the first couple of verses. Romans 8 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, I want us to feel the weight of that this morning. I'm going to read this again more slowly, and I want us to really think about what is God saying here in just these couple of verses to all of us in the room. Therefore, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so here's the amazing thing about this, that God's desire is to offer every single one of us, everyone in Pierce County, every single person on planet Earth, a condemnation-free life. Think about all the ways that we're trapped by our shame, and what God says in his word is, I want you to live free from that. But here's the thing, it makes me really mad that the caricature in our culture of Christians is that, oh, people who go to church, those people are judgmental and hypocritical and mean, and I don't want anything to do with them, okay? This drives me nuts because we are supposed to be the people of freedom, right? And so what's, what's wrong? And so, you know, some will say, uh, as we go down kind of this, this rabbit trail, oh, well, you know, like, Romans is about sin, right? And you have to, you have to know your sin, and that's where we start, and that's what, what we, need to, we need to start with and end with and, and begin with, and that's what it's talking about, Jeff. And here's the thing. Like, obviously, if you've ever read the book of Romans, yes, it talks about the reality of sin in our lives, and we need to recognize that. 
But the way we talk about sin is incredibly important if we want people to ever get to the point where they're experiencing freedom in Christ, if they're experiencing the freedom that is supposed to come through faith. And I just think for some Christians, it's more about us feeling good that we spoke the truth and making other people feel bad than actually helping people begin a relationship with God, than actually helping people access freedom in their lives. Because our concern should be that people experience that freedom from sin, that freedom from shame. We began a teaching series, or, or we began this month in January looking at a couple guideposts. What guides us as a church? What's fixed and unchanging? And we talked about the Great Commission, the fact that it is for all of us who follow Jesus by going about your life that you help others, uh, that you make disciples, which means you help others follow Jesus. That's the goal. That's what drives us. Are we helping other people experience the freedom that comes from faith? Or are we just concerned with, oh, well, we just we spoke the truth, and so that's all we need to do. Uh, I've shared this story before, but uh, when I was in Bible college and undergrad, I, we had to do, have an assigned ministry or you had to sign up for one. So you were doing, you know, the, you're doing ministry alongside learning about it. It's a highly effective uh, learning practice. I, I highly recommend doing and learning at the same time. Um, but the, the first semester, it's assigned to you. And so my fall semester, I was assigned to do street evangelism. And yes, it sounds, it, it was as painful as it sounds, okay? Uh, it's literally like some downtown Chicago, like on a couple blocks away from Michigan Avenue, and somebody gets a little easel, and if you've been around church a while, they begin to, to draw the bridge principle, which is like, here's God, here's us, there's this big scary gap between, and there's bad stuff and sin and hell here, and there's no way you can cross over, and then you paint or draw a little cross, and that's the bridge between you and God. And so, and then there would be some of us who'd be handing out like pamphlets on either side of this presentation going on uh, in the middle of downtown Chicago. Now, here's the thing, that is factually correct. There's nothing wrong with that presentation. What was wrong was that hundreds of people are walking by and they don't care. They are not interested in listening. In fact, anybody who does pick up a pamphlet, like they just fling it in the gutter. And so, again, a, a few weeks of doing this, I realized something that has stuck with me for, for my entire life. That was actually a failure to preach the gospel. That was just putting stuff out on blast in the world. It's a failure to preach the gospel because it was not incarnational. It was 0% relational. And that is never how Jesus interacts with anybody. Okay, and so again, I'll work out my stuff later. But um, here's what I want us to know from that experience. More people are going to be won over to a relationship with God by seeing in real life another human being whose life has been transformed by the power and the grace of Jesus and seeing the beauty of that life, of seeing in somebody else's life how we've overcome shame in our lives because of what Jesus has done. That's where the power lies. Rather than trying to convince people to apply for a get-out-of-hell-free card, okay, or scare them into applying for it, Right? It's just simply there's a, a wild difference between those two experiences, and I think we miss it. Because think about it. If we sit down with somebody and we build a relationship and we have the opportunity to share how the creator of the universe wants you and I to live free from shame, like, that's going to go places. That's going to give us a chance to actually explain the gospel in relationship with somebody else. And it actually leads to the second kind of point about shame. Uh, to break the cycle of shame in our lives, we need to recognize that shame is a foreign element in our hearts and minds. It's just simply a foreign element. It's not supposed to be there. You know, the Bible tells us that originally we were created good. If you look at the very beginning uh, in, in Genesis and the beginning of the story of, of people's interaction with God and how he created us, he created us to be good. And we see this reflected right at the beginning in Genesis chapter 2. It says, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame in Genesis uh, chapter 2 verse 25. 
And then sin enters the picture. And just a few verses later, one chapter over at the top of this, we see how things have changed because sin has entered the picture and shame has rode right along with it into our experience as people. Genesis 3.10 says, He, Adam, answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And I can't get into all the, like, the narrative things that are happening with the Hebrew, and I'll be honest, uh, my Hebrew from seminary was, I was never good at Hebrew. Greek, much better, but Hebrew, it's like right to left, and there's these weird symbols. There's nothing that correlates to English. Like, I'm out. Ah, uh, it's too hard. But, um, but anyways, in, in, the, in the original Hebrew, in the narrative here, there's this connection uh, between nakedness and shame, that being fully seen and fully known is how God created us to be in relationship with him. But once sin enters the picture, shame comes along, and we don't want to be seen, okay? Because of our sin, we want to hide. And this isn't just like a little like Bible trivia moment, like, oh, a little nugget of biblical, you know, truth that I didn't understand before. This is a foundational thing to understand about God's story between, uh, between us and God and how God wants to relate to us. Because you and I hide, okay? When, when we have sin, we don't want other people to know. We don't want to be vulnerable, weak, uh, look down upon, feel bad, whatever it is. And so we try and hide that shame from others. And it causes all sorts of problems because shame is a foreign element. It's not supposed to be there, but because it is, it creates problems for how we relate to God, it creates problems for how we relate to each other, and it creates problems for how we just interact and relate to the world around us. Okay, and here's the thing. If shame is a foreign invader to our hearts and our minds, then it simply doesn't belong. It just simply doesn't belong. Uh, let me give you an example to kind of help understand what, what this means for us. So my family and I, we love uh, exploring the national parks, and so we've got a goal to see all, you know, 60-some-odd of the, the main major kind of national parks. And so we've done about 25, and one of the ones we've been to is the Florida Everglades. Uh, and in the Florida Everglades, like many places, there's this challenge of invasive species. And one of those invasive species that's not supposed to be in the Florida Everglades is this guy, the Burmese python. Okay, I love the fact that there are so many jobs in the world, and it is somebody, I know, right? Like, yeah, this creeps me out too. Okay, like this is somebody's job to go find this snake in the swamp, and I don't know what the two people who are smiling on the end, the only appropriate face is that guy who's like, get me out of here as quick as possible. If this thing wants to take them out, like they're done. Like that thing is gigantic. Uh, and so it begs the question, first of all, like, who signs up for this job? That's my first question. My second question is like, how did it get there, right? How did it get there? Uh, well, there's some Florida man or Florida men's uh, decided to have this cool exotic pet, a Burmese python. Sounds good until it's like 10 feet long. And like, I don't want to take care of this thing anymore. I'm tired of, I don't know, feeding gigantic rats to it every day. And so, ah, I have a great idea. I'll dump this giant snake into the Everglades because sure, let's add gigantic snake to Gatorland. This sounds like a great idea. Nothing bad's going to come out of this. Um, and so probably they estimate like late 70s, somebody did this. Uh, and in the early 2000s, the population of the Burmese python really started to take off. And it, it basically wiped out a lot of the small mammal population. Uh, possums, rabbits, raccoons uh, are, are almost been wiped out, bobcats. There was one of these pythons was found to have swallowed, eaten whole an entire deer. Okay, like, I don't want to be near anything that can do that. Um, but here's the thing. Why has the python, the Burmese python, proliferated so well in the Florida Everglades? And there's two reasons. Number one, the Burmese python has no natural predators there. And secondly, it is really hard to spot one. If it wants to stay hidden, it's going to stay hidden. And I share that because this is exactly how shame works. This is how shame works in our lives, that, that it doesn't have a natural predator. Unless we are intentionally seeking to root it out, it's going to grow and grow and grow. And it's hard for us to recognize the source of those scripts of shame in our lives. And so just like it takes time to rehabilitate a, an environment uh, that's been 
you know, uh, taken over by another species or, or invaded by another species. It's the same with shame in our lives, that we've got to intentionally seek to root it out, and it's going to take time to reclaim that habitat in our hearts and our minds that, that sin and shame have overtaken, okay? Um, but there's no, there's no accidental way around it. And so I want to continue to look at Romans 8. We're going to pick back up in verse 3 and see uh, how we can do this work and, and how we can understand how to do this work better. It says, for the law, or what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the, by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And so there's a lot going on there that we can't unpack to, together this morning, uh, but a couple, a couple key things help you just interpret what's going on in this passage. Um, so first of all, that term, the flesh, like literally it, it refers to like our bodies, like our, our flesh, our, our skin and bones, like that, that part of our existence. But most often when it's used in one of the New Testament letters, it's used in this metaphorical sense to represent uh, our sin nature. Like the way we operate, that we want to be free as human beings to do what I want, when I want, and when I want to do it with whomever I want. Thank you very much. Uh, and we all, I think if we're being honest, we understand this, this push that we have against anyone telling us what to do, whether it's God or anybody else, right? Uh, we've, all, we've all experienced that reality in our lives. And so what does the passage say? The passage says, we looked at, hopefully you got it open, you can look back at it, where it says that Jesus was a sin offering for us to do what the law could never do. And so when it's referring to the law, in the, in the Old Testament, there are, were some laws given to the people of ancient Israel by God, and he said, hey, keep these. And then hundreds and even, you know, a thousand plus years go by, and the people fail to keep the law over and over and over again. And the law was actually given for that very point so that we would understand there is no way, there's no cultural situation, there's no trying hard enough where you can ever live up to this standard of being perfect enough to earn your relationship with God. It is not possible. Therefore, it should drive us to say, I need the mercy and grace of God in my life. Because I can't, I can't earn my way there, so I need God's grace and mercy because, I, because of the failure to live up to those standards. Uh, but here's what happens. The enemy comes in and he twists that thought at that moment. And instead of reaching out for mercy and grace, we feel shame instead. We feel shame that we weren't able to live up to the standard. That in some way we failed, we weren't good enough, Oh, we must be such a failure to God and others. And then that, that narrative begins to build in our, in our minds. That cycle begins to strengthen and shame begins to build, if we're not careful, that stronghold because it becomes so predominant in our lives. And so that experience of shame is what Paul writes about here in Romans 8. He captures that by this struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And again, the problem is that we all experience the struggle but rather than recognizing because we all struggle with sin in some way, shape, or form, one or the other, that we need the grace of God in our lives and we need the empathy and mercy from others, instead of reaching out for that, we feel bad and so we, we, we turn inward and we begin to feel shame about the way that we fail in meeting that struggle, even though it is common to each and every one of us, even though God has proven none of us can measure up to the standard, yet we still hold on to the shame for not being able to do so. It's not how we were meant to live. We've got to remember that shame is an invasive species. It doesn't belong. We weren't intended to live with it. And so, then how do we live not stuck in this pattern, this cycle of shame? How do we actually break free from it? 
And that leads really to the last step that we want to talk about this morning, which is simply this. To break that cycle of shame in our lives, we need to honestly confess your struggle so that you can change your mind about yourself. We need to honestly confess our struggle so that we can change our mind about ourselves. That we can break free from the way we view ourselves. We can break free from that script of shame that rolls in our minds. And we can begin to think of ourselves the way that God views us, the way that God sees us. Okay? Um, you know, the God who created the galaxies and all the intricate beauty on our planet and the, the detail of, uh, you know, level of detail in all of creation, right? The God who created all of that in Genesis, he describes us as the pinnacle of his creation. So feel this for a moment, that you and I, God views us as grander than the Grand Canyon. God views you and I as more majestic than Mount Rainier. Like, wouldn't there be some radical change in our lives if we began to view ourselves that way? If that was the script that we began to listen to, rather than the script of shame, which says, you're not good enough. You're never going to overcome this. You're such a failure. Nobody's ever going to love you. Why can't you get your stuff together? We see, the, we see the difference. We see the way that, again, Jesus came to free us from those scripts of shame that we return to again and again and again. And just like that python in the Everglades, it's going to keep stalking you if you allow it to do so. Shame continues to slither around in our minds and builds up strength time and time again unless we intentionally look for ways to change the way we think about ourselves by changing the way we think about ourselves by replacing it with the way that God views us. Because really the good news that I want to read just a little bit more of Romans 8 before we wrap up is that that's what Jesus came to do, to free us from the power of sin and shame. And we need to recognize and realize that there's a power greater than shame offered to each and every one of us today. Look with me in Romans 8, uh, picking back up in verse 9. It says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. So we have got a choice to make. Are we going to continue to listen to that script that keeps us trapped in shame, or are we going to listen to the voice that died to free us from the power of sin and shame in our lives. And so I opened with a reference to uh, a U2 song. I want to close with another reference from uh, the great uh, musical musings, uh, singer, songwriter, philosopher of our age, Taylor Swift. Uh, and so, okay, don't judge me. This is a series on breaking shame, okay? I have a 12-year-old daughter, and maybe sometimes after I drop her off, the album keeps rolling. You'll never know. But... Um, She's got a song where she talks about this guy who treats her less than, looks down uh, on, on her a bit, and they do this, this kind of shame dance, and she sings that in this song, we are never, ever, ever getting back together. You go talk to your friends, talk to my friends, talk to me, but we are never, ever, ever getting back together, like ever, okay? Okay. And I share that mostly lightheartedly, um, and also because it's stuck in my head, too. Uh, but I share that because I want us to have that, that picture of shame, right? Like, maybe you dated somebody in your past, uh, and you knew they were not good for you, and then they kind of they, they creep back into your life, right? They, they, they slide back into your life, and you knew you shouldn't get back with them, but you just did anyways, Right? And, and bad things were produced in that outcome. Here's the thing. That's exactly how shame works. It just creeps back around. It just kind of slithers back around in our minds, and it's going to keep stalking you unless you do something about it. You've got to decide at some point, just drawing a line and saying, this shame is no longer going to, to you know, just rule my thoughts and my life and the way I think. Okay? 
Now, here's the thing. It doesn't mean that we're, we're never going to feel feelings of shame. Nope, that's just called being human, okay? It's never that you're never going to think those thoughts ever again. No, of course we're going to think those thoughts. Again, check being human. Um, but what it means is that you are not going to allow this script of shame to be the thing that, that rules over your thought life. No longer is it going to be the thing in charge. No longer is it going to hold this power over you that you're making a decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replace that script when I hear it with a new one that God has for me. And so how do you actually get started with that? I'm glad you asked. Um, we have something here at Rainier View that we do uh, every so often called Rooted, and Rooted uh, comes with this, this nice fancy book, uh, but it's just a 10-week discipleship experience, a small group um, experience, and it really kind of goes through some of the basics of the Christian life and how to live those out, and one of the things in that Rooted experience on week five, day five, is something uh, that we do is we cover these strongholds, and so we've given you kind of a slice of this experience, a, a very small slice uh, hopefully you got uh, this sheet coming in. If not, it's on the back table. Um, but we want to talk about breaking the cycle of shame. And when we look at our strongholds, these could be things that we, we currently struggle with, or they could be areas that, if we're not careful, we can drift into this controlling our lives. And so they, uh, on day five, and I'm encouraging you this week to take this and just take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and sit with these areas and sometimes, if you're like me, to find out maybe what you got to pay attention to, you have to look at the area of freedom and say, why am I not experiencing freedom in, in my life in this area? And uh, here's the thing. Uh, I went through Rooted this fall with some of our small group members, and the, the struggle for me that is continual and constant in my life, it's the struggle with contentment, to really just be content with, with what God has given me and he's called me to do and that be okay I was like, no, but I want a little bit more. <laughs> and, and so that's the struggle. And now identifying that, what's painful about this experience is, do you know what the stronghold is across from contentment? It's idolatry. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm a pastor. This book is clearly defective. Uh, I can't struggle with idolatry. That's bad, right? And so here's the thing. This is why we want you to sit with this this week. This is why we want you to take stock of what are those scripts, what am I listening to? Because once you gain clarity, right, and in, in the Rooted experience, you kind of, with a few people in your group, you walk through and you share. Uh, and so it's like, okay, like this isn't like, again, a stronghold to the point where it's controlling me, but this is an area I've got to pay attention to because it is easy for me to be discontented. It's easy for me to just think, well, I should have accomplished more, I should have more, and because I don't, that's a script of shame that can play in my mind. And so I've got to recognize it, and here's the thing, you say that out loud to, to a few other people, in the light of day, you realize, what a dumb thought. <laughs> Why do I think this, right? Uh, but that's how shame works, because it keeps us trapped. Um, and so that's what we want, we want for you. Um, and just again, to recap, uh, and I'm going to invite the worship team on up at this point. Um, we're going to close with one more song, but as they're coming up, I want to just, again, touch on those three steps again. First step, choose to believe that the God of the universe wants you to be free of those feelings of shame. Step two, recognize that shame is a foreign substance to our heart and our minds. And then step three, honestly confess your struggle so that you can change your mind about yourself. But I actually have a fourth step. You've got to verbalize this to someone else. Whatever your shame script is that, that kind of loops and keeps coming back around in your mind that's opposed to what God wants for you, you've got to find somebody else to verbalize that out loud too. If, if you need to, come up and we'll pray afterwards. Find somebody to share, share with before you leave here, anybody that you trust, because when you begin to verbalize that out loud to somebody else, that's when God can begin to break that cycle of shame in a deeper and a more real and a profound way. Let me pray for you and then we'll sing one last song. God, I pray right now that the struggles that we're holding on to, the things that we don't want anyone to know about, the pains that maybe 
are getting stirred up and we thought we dealt with or we weren't even aware that they were there, God, would you help us as we continue through this series identify what those strongholds or potential areas of struggle may be, that we can take steps towards freedom, that we can listen to the scripts that you have for us, that we can live the kind of life of freedom that we read about in your word, that we can experience that together. Help us leave here knowing clearly what we need to do. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us here at RVCC Online here today. Again, my name is Crystal, and I would just love for you to personally reach out. You can do so at crystalc at rainierview.org and just be a part of our church family. We love doing life with you here at Rainier View. And as just a quick reminder, again, you can head out to rainierview.org slash online, and there you can find all of our amazing and incredible tools. You can get our past messages, you can follow us on socials, and you can listen to our podcast there as well. That is a great tool to have throughout the week. So don't just click off here, head out to our website. Thanks again for being here, and we'll see you next week.